We can't leave those goddesses out. So love by definition is actually, perfectionism is actually the antithesis of love. Love by definition happens when it's safe to fall short in the presence of another. Think of those whom you've met in life who seem flawless to you. While we may admire or even envy those people, we rarely love them. Think of somebody perfect that you know. You might envy them, but do you love them? I just got an email. It says, it's not our perfections that make us lovable, but rather our very human vulnerabilities and faults. Psychologist Nathaniel Brandon popularized the term the disowned self. The disowned self is what we're working with today. So the disowned self became a thing back in the 1970s with a book called The Disowned Self. And this author alerted us to the dangers of self-alienation, the turning away from our own internal experiences, the judging of whole parts of ourselves as unacceptable, unwanted, and unworthy of acknowledgement. Candace was in her 60s. Her pattern was to lose herself when in a relationship. It says disowning her angry self made it nearly impossible to negotiate for her own needs in an intimate relationship, and it prevented her from engaging in conflict, which is necessary to developing healthy intimacy with another person. Many of the things that we judge as unacceptable about ourselves are actually gifts, talents, or aptitudes driven underground in response to being shamed, blamed, or taunted. Martina was born with a natural talent for leadership, yet at the age of five, this propensity showed up as bossiness. It would have been wonderful if her teacher had recognized her talents for leadership, but she took it upon herself to rein in Martina. So little by little, Martina internalized the constant chastising by her teacher as an idea about herself that was too much. It says over the years, she had been shaming and berating herself for her organic big energy. When dating someone new, she would do her best to dim down so as not to turn him off. Most of us were taught to reject and disown much of who and what we are. Little by little, we sliced off slivers of our souls, trying to be like everyone else so that we would fit in. Hiding became a primary pastime as we began disappearing whole parts of ourselves in exchange for love, a.k.a. dimming our light. If you want true love to come into your life, you must begin by becoming your whole true self. The beautiful as well as the bad, the noble as well as the notorious, the magnificent as well as the malicious. And then you open yourself up to the possibility of being loved in the ways that you actually need to be loved. When we meet somebody who we perceive has the qualities that we're disowning in ourselves, we'll tend to do one of two things. Either we judge them harshly or we idealize them, assuming that they are superior to us. I totally did that with that Mike, the broker, the real estate broker guy, I was like, he's an entrepreneur, he's badass, he's good looking, he's successful, he's like a lion at work. I want to be like him. And so I basically created an ideal of him and then I idealized him so he wasn't even a person anymore. He was like this perfect like pillar of somebody that I wanted to be. And basically, when we do that, when we idealize somebody, we make them superior to ourselves. So it says, for example, Jerry kept dating musician songwriters until he finally admitted his secret, his lifelong dream of being one himself. Sometimes it's not so much what we want in a person as much as the fact we want to be that person. You look like your lion picture right now. <laughs> hey, goddess. So here is practice number 19. It's called claiming yourself fully. So I'm going to just read this to you. I'm not going to do this today because I don't have art supplies. It says take out your art supplies. There are several ways you might choose to do this practice. Read through my suggestions and choose to work on one today. So number one that you can do is draw or paint a self-portrait inclusive of all your qualities. So you can paint a simple picture of yourself 
in a large piece of paper in the center. It doesn't have to look like you, but allow yourself to be a child, draw and paint more for fun than the need to do it right. And it says one by one, add the following qualities. My power, my beauty, my talent, my greatness, my vulnerability, my light, my sexuality, my anger, my love. So you can do those nine qualities uh, that you add on to a self-portrait that you draw or paint of yourself with all of your qualities. Number two option is you could make a collage of your qualities where you glue a photo of yourself in the center of a piece of paper or on a piece of cardboard. And it says you look through magazines for images that express these qualities. It says glue them all around your photo. Write the name of each quality next to the picture as an I am statement. Ooh, I like that. Maybe I could do that with my vision board. If I just took a screenshot of my vision board from Pinterest, put all of them, the images together as like a screensaver, and then copied that into, like imported the image into a Google Doc, and then like just like labeled it. Okay, third, you can create dance movements or poses to represent your qualities. It says put, ooh, I could definitely do this today. It says put on some music that you love. Dance around the room by yourself to get your body flowing. And then use your body to create a pose, a dance step, or a body movement of each of the qualities listed. You can use a mirror if that feels good to you. When you find a pose that expresses the quality fully and you feel it in your body, claim it with your voice by saying it loudly. I am powerful. I own my beauty. I am talented. I feel my greatness. I am safe to be vulnerable. I feel my light. I am sexy. I feel my anger. I am love. It says when you're finished, take out your journal and answer the following questions. What have, okay, so we can do this journal thing. And it says, what have I been turning away from in myself? Reluctant to own fully. So what have I not wanted to own? Or what have I been turning away for in myself? So go ahead and get out your journal. Question number one. What have I been turning away from in myself? What parts of myself do I not want to own fully? Hmm. I feel like I don't really want to like own my sexuality fully. Because my dad was like always such a slut shamer. <laughs> So I'll write down, I don't want to own my sexuality fully, or I've been reluctant to. It's a slippery slope. One day I'm not wearing a bra and I'm showing nipples. The other day I'm like going to church and being really conservative and not even showing cleavage. Like, that's bipolar for you. What have I been turning away from in myself, reluctant to own fully? Why don't you do like two or three things? So for me, I've been reluctant to fully own my sexuality, number one. Number two, oh, hey, Megan. I just saw your note. Number two, I've been reluctant to own my bitchiness. Yes, I've always been a natural bitch and a natural leader, but I got so tired of being called bossy or snobby or bitchy. I think I like disowned and like, covered the light and kind of like shrunk down that part of me. And the truth is the world needs more bitches because weak people are very dangerous. And number three, what other part goddess have you been turning away for turning away from or reluctant to own fully? Megan says it's been my body or appearance for me. Hmm. Let's see. Well, actually, that's true for me, too. Uh, I've been reluctant to own my Buddha belly, which actually... Which actually could be like a fetish or something. I'm sure that there are men, I actually know that there's men, who they love seeing like a nice round woman with like a pregnancy belly who it reminds, it's like very maternal. That's like a turn on for them. So I'm going to say my pregnancy belly. Okay, so those are the three parts. 
I've been turning away from in myself, reluctant to own fully my sexuality, my bitchiness, and my pregnancy value. <laughs> All right, number two. What parts of me have I been unwilling to express freely? Hmm. I don't freely express my singing. And I'm not saying my singing voice because it's not the voice that matters. It's the fact that I love singing and that's always been a virtue for me. But I don't fully express it because I feel like it's only received as like, is she a good singer or is she not? But really singing is singing. So I have to stop judging that as good or bad, positive or negative, lovable or unlovable, because singing is just expression and all expression is, is sacred. Elevated Vibe says my personal power and influence on others. Beautiful. So number two is what parts of me have I been unwilling to express freely? I'll say singing, singing songs. And another part that I don't express freely is the part that's a healer, to be frank. You have to be so careful because you'll always want to work on yourself. Like, you'll always want to work on your friends, your family. So many times when I'm out in public, I, like, feel like I should go up to somebody and, like, just, like, hey, I have, like, this wisdom for you. I feel like I'm meant to tell you this. This is probably something you really need to hear. And it's, like... You're literally going to like the depths of your soul to give somebody a message that they might not be open to, that they didn't pay for, that they're not going to value. And then they might not appreciate the, mes the, the message that you give them. As Tony Robbins says, people don't value what they don't pay for. They might not even appreciate it. And then that's going to like hurt your relationship with your own voice because now you'll be like, oh, my voice was off. They didn't receive it. It didn't go well. They didn't receive me well. I probably shouldn't go up and deliver other inspired messages for, for people. So I'll say the number two, what parts of me have I been unwilling to express freely? Singing songs, the healer self, and the daughter. I wish that I was more available to being my dad's daughter. And I, th I feel like I'm not because I feel like he doesn't really own his identity as a father anyways. It's kind of hard to want to be available as a daughter to somebody who like just treats you like they're your they're your their neighbor or something. <laughs> okay, good job. So 3. What has it been costing myself and others to hide these parts of myself? It's cost me liberation. It's cost me time. It's cost me money. Who knows? Maybe if I sang more, I would have a record deal, right? It's cost me liberation. It's cost me time. It's cost me money. It's cost me depth in connections. Basically, if there's a part of myself, as it says here, what is it called again? The disowned self. If, you have, if you're disowning a part of yourself, it's all in authenticity. It's all shame. So it's cost me self-acceptance. Good. Good. So what has it been costing myself and others to hide these parts of myself? I wrote liberation, time, money, depth and connection, and self-acceptance. Megan says, my personal style and physical expression of emotions for me. Mmm. Yeah, your physical style has suffered. Interesting. Thanks for sharing. Number four is how might I be projecting these disowned parts of myself onto others? Well, when you're not standing in your power, you definitely don't invite others to stand in their power. It's like being at church today. You know how like when you're standing up and worshiping and it's like if the people around you are doing the whole like Christian jargon, the whole like worship dance that everyone does where it's just everyone does this and they all just sheepishly copy each other instead of like some type of like authentic expression, everyone just does this or like, oh, you know, it's like if the person next to you is like really tense and closed up. I remember my dad used to be super uncomfortable in church. Um, if the person next to you is not really modeling that, 
if there's a disowned part of somebody next to you in church, for example, that has disowned the part where they get to express, they get to sing, they get to dance, they get to worship freely in public, then they definitely project that onto everyone around them, right? Whereas, like, if there's somebody in the dance floor who's like, and that's why I think I'm an expander for a lot of women. Sometimes I don't wear a bra. Sometimes I don't wear makeup. Sometimes I don't do my hair. And that gives other women permission because they see me. They're like, she's being, like, totally real. And I'm not sitting here judging her. So I have permission to be real and know that other people aren't sitting there judging me. You stop, when you stop judging yourself, you stop judging other people. And that's just spiritual law. So how might I be projecting these disowned parts of myself onto others? Let me start with sexuality. If I have disowned my sexuality, I do have a tendency to think that other people are like over-sexualized, especially because I work with so many women and I so deeply understand like sexual trauma and shame and how the people who have experienced sexual trauma usually become over-sexualized like to the max and they begin that's the foot that they start leading with so I think if I didn't disown my own sexuality then I wouldn't project that disowned part of myself onto others meaning I wouldn't see other people as over-sexualized or not and then my second one in question number one was bitchiness so how might I project these disowned parts of myself into others well usually I like bitches but I just never meet I never meet any I wish how can I be projecting that disowned part that would be like I'm projecting that she is a bitch because I'm not reconciled to fully being a bitch whereas like if you're a bitch you just appreciate other bitchiness am I understanding this question right how might I be projecting these disowned parts of myself onto others pregnancy belly yeah I don't judge other people like that actually when I see somebody who's fat or overweight I'm just like oh totally get it <laughs> totally get it that's how they're that's how they're coping. The hard part about being overweight is that your what you do in secret it like lives on you. There's you can't it's like with drinking. Like maybe you can hide it. This is like before you get jaundice and stuff. Or maybe like when you get high, right? Which I cannot believe that I quit weed like a month ago. I miss it all the fucking time. But it's almost like I lost my thought, so okay, how might I be projecting these disowned parts of myself onto others? Let's see what Megan said. Megan says it causes people to show oh, it causes people to show up in ways that may be out of character for them as well. Mmm. I think inauthenticity is contagious. I totally agree. That makes sense to me. Thank you for sharing, Meg. So number five. Yeah, I mean, honestly, I really don't, I, I really don't judge women, maybe because I don't really judge myself anymore. So I wouldn't say that I project much. I project these disowned parts of myself. Yeah, because when I see a woman being a bitch or bitchy or bossy or a leader or the mother of the pack or the lone wolf or the alpha or the lioness, I'm just like, respect. So I don't really project that onto other people. I see what I want in somebody else and I imitate it. I own it, I make my own. All right, question number six. What parts of myself do I want to turn toward and express more fully? Number six. Hmm. I want to express the singer side more. Have you ever heard of, um, in spirituality, there's something called the path of the sacred whore. Have you ever heard of that? There's something called the path of the sacred whore. And my spiritual teacher, Mami Onami, 
is on that path. It's like basically like an, I don't want to say it's like a feminine archetype, but she was like raised in a sex cult or something and really had like a lot of sexual trauma. Like this is all public knowledge. And sometimes women who have sexual trauma, like I said earlier, they become like super over sexualized and then they start leading with that foot. And like all of a sudden their whole life is about sex. They usually, sometimes they go into sex work or they turn into like a pole dancer or something. And it's like, everything is about their sexuality. And what parts of myself do I want to turn toward and express more fully? Uh, like the path of the sacred whore. Anyways, you could Google it. It's, it's literally, it's a life path is my whole point in bringing that up. It's literally a life path. Some women are on path of the sacred whore, which means that their sexual trauma is meant to be an integrative teaching from, for the rest of their life. Like they're supposed to transmute that sexual trauma into like a sexual healer for other people who've had sexual trauma. All right. So number six, what parts of myself do I want to turn toward and express more freely? I want to express my bigness. That just came to me. I just want to like, who is it? Uh, Sherry. Uh, there is this woman who, I swear to God, she's like five foot 10. She's just broad. She's not even fast. She's not even overweight. She's just big. And I just want to own that. I mean, I'm only five, seven, 201 pounds, but if I could just really like own my bigness and be like, yeah, I take up space. Like, yeah, I'm overweight. That's why my boots are big too. Like it's actually nice. I just want to like own my bigness more. I feel like myself or people who are overweight, we're always like trying to like, Oh, don't look at from that angle or like, Oh, I'll just be sucking in the whole time or no. I want to turn toward and express more fully my bigness, my immenseness. I mean, it could totally be seen as a strength. Number seven, what would I need to give up in order to do this? Tiff says, that's an important season for many of my clients. Two of them, because it's more of a core part that had, that had true resonance. Thanks, Tiff. So glad that you're here. So number seven, what would I need to give up in order to do this? I would need to give up being a healthy weight. I would need to give up being fit. I would need to just give up the idea that I'm too fat to be useful. Because a lot of the times, and maybe this is my own judgment and projection, but like if I see a coach, I'll just be totally frank. If I see a coach who's overweight, I'm just like, dude, get your shit together. Like, how can you tell people what to do if you can't even tell your own self what to do? You can't stick to your diet. You're not that healthy. You have high cholesterol. This is all me, by the way, all my projection. Like, Jackie, like you're an NLP practitioner. That's like, you're, you're literally trained to make the subconscious mind your bitch and be a master over your subconscious. And the subconscious rules 95% of what happens in our life. So where is the discipline over that asset of your subconscious mind? So I, I feel like it does cost me credibility So I can see why people probably don't buy into me as much because of that. But then at the same time, I also see how my weight is exactly why I'm credible to people because I don't just, I can't just rely on my looks. I actually have to use my personality. I actually have to use my spiritual gifts. I actually have to use my heart because keep in mind, women and men were either a brain, body, or a heart. And Matthew Hussey says that we need to be two out of three to do a, to be a um, unique pairing. So brain, body, heart. So for me, if I'm not a body, then I'm a brain and a heart. 
Megan says, I would have to give up fear. I would have to give up limiting beliefs that were projected onto me as a child. Tiff says, your bigness resonates, I mean, as something to amp up. Your process is so fucking beautiful, woman. Your power in claiming this... Your your power is in fully claiming this bigness. <gasps> yes, goddess. I no longer disavow that part of me that I'm too big to be useful. Because actually, I think a huge reason that women would listen to me, that I do have credibility in my advice is because I don't get by just on looks. I don't get by just on looks. And it's interesting because a lot of the clients that I have are like straight up professional models. And I'm like, why are you coming to me? You have a perfect body. You're rich. You have the things that I don't have. And they're coming to me <laughs> Because I have the energy that they want. I have the self-love that they want. Like we just have different resources to pull from. So thank you for saying that. Thank you for saying that, Tiff. Your power is in fully claiming this bigness. Yes, I need to fucking claim it. I need to claim it. It's not something that destroys my credibility. Maybe it's something that makes people more comfortable with me. Maybe it's something that makes people see, yeah, she's a human. She has fucking issues. Thanks for saying that, goddess. So what parts of myself do I want to turn toward and express more fully? My singer part, my bigness, and my immenseness. What would I need to give up in order to do this? I would have to give up that you can only be healthy if you're thin and fit. And I just had, I just got my blood, my blood work results back yesterday, by the way. The only thing that's fucked up is vitamin D and my cholesterol, which I was, I'm not happy about that. I accept it. I take radical responsibility. It's important for me to get my cholesterol down. I'm 28. Tiff says, and we don't need to disavow beauty here. You're fucking beautiful. It's just blocking you at the moment. Yes. Yes, you are whatever weight or look or beauty, or whatever that you are. So if you're not owning it, just own your shit. There's alchemical power you don't even know because this weight is in your way. Yes, yes, I've chosen to see the weight as an issue. Spiritual law says that you cannot graduate from a lesson until you've gotten everything that you need from that lesson which is so it's such a brain trip to me because i did in 2021 i went from 205 pounds to 160 from february to december just by walking every day just by walking an hour every day and also i was like eating like 1200 calories a day which was like a huge mind fuck and then i gained it all back in six months of Going out on a date every single night, dinner, dessert, appetizer, entree, multiple desserts every single night, going out to eat every single night for six months, I gained it all back, like 40 pounds or whatever. And now I'm 201 again. I'm literally at my starting weight. So it's like, okay, obviously I'm not ready to release that. And I wouldn't want to release this weight back to the universe until I was able to make radical peace and acceptance with it. And if I'm still waking up every day feeling like I need to change, I need to get this down, I need to get this weight off, I need to get my shit under control, I need to get my food together, I need to work out two hours a day, then that's not me accepting it. Tiff says, alchemical power because you've buried power in this block, so this might shift post alignment. Wow, that's beautiful, goddess. I've definitely buried some power in here. Instead of just owning it. Like, yeah, I'm big. I'm big in this season. I'm a big bitch. <laughs> yes, I could see totally where I have a power block there. Thank you. What would I need to give up in order to do this? The, the idea that you can't be healthy unless you're thin and fit. For me, health would be getting my vitamin D up and not having high cholesterol. Whether you're overweight or not, 
I do feel like I'm healthy. I do work out an hour a day. So what would I have to give up? The idea that you can only be healthy if you're thin and fit. And I would also need to give up my... Ooh! I would... Self-criticism. I started following last night. Her name is Alara Sage. Like A-L-A-R-A. -A -A. I started... I became friends with her on Facebook through a be a guest community. It's like find a podcast guest. And oh my God, she's all about like... Um, Owning your pleasure and feminine power and releasing your shock tea, which is like energy or something. Like I'm, I don't know too much about the like Indian names, but like shock tea energy, moving your pelvis, and it's like wow, this goddess just like totally gives me permission to like. I don't know. It just reminds me of like pussy power, and I just think I've been like raised like between being a Christian and being like raised by a military family. I just feel like these are some parts that like have been disavowed or not fully expressed because I'm always telling myself, you look like slut, you look like slut, you look like a prostitute, you look like a whore, don't dress slutty because that's exactly what my dad used to always say to me. <laughs> so what might the rewards be for myself and others to express these parts of me more fully? The rewards might be that I give myself permission to to just be and exist and accept myself. And the reward and gift of that would be that other women do exactly the same. All right, goddess, last thing I'll say, bonus practice and action. Do at least one thing today that represents a willingness to risk expressing more of your authentic self. Does this mean do like a strip tease later? For example, share an opinion when you normally would keep quiet. Purchase an article of clothing that expresses a previously hidden aspect of yourself. I knew it. Like, that would be like buy some lingerie or something. Sign up for dance lessons to recapture a childhood fantasy, etc. I love us. I love this community. This, this stuff is like such healing work. Our goddess, I actually have to get in the shower because I have a commitment in a couple minutes. All right, goddess, love you. Thanks for being here. And don't forget our feminine revival four week group coaching program and goddess circle and sacred sisterhood starts on Wednesday night is our kickoff group coaching call. So if you are on my email list, you got that email last night. Um, ooh, Megan says, I started to do a pole dancing class. It was amazing. Oh my gosh. I took one in... 2016 or 17 it was amazing just to be around other women that's what it was for me to be around other women who weren't slut shaming themselves that was healing that was so healing i'm so glad i got to talk to you megan all right goddess i will see you tomorrow for lesson 20 um of calling in the one love you so much and hope to see you in my four-week goddess circle happy easter again love you goddess and talk to you soon thank you megan happy easter